Welcome back for another video where I make you question everything you thought you once knew about SIBO. Hopefully in a good way. Hopefully in a way that helps you feel better ASAP. But nonetheless, here we are again. This is part three of a multi-part series. In the first video, we examined the high, high rate of false positives with lactulose SIBO breath testing. In part two, we examined the rate of false positives with glucose-based breath testing. And now, number three, we're rounding it out with the rate of false negatives with glucose-based testing. The number one reason that I see this cited in clinician groups and normal people groups alike is that people talk about that glucose is readily absorbed in the small intestine, upper part of the small intestine in particular, and it doesn't make it to the ileum, the last portion of the small bowel, where you could have overgrowth. Therefore, glucose has a likelihood that it will miss distal SIBO. But is that true? Well, time will tell. Come with me on a journey. Let me make a head bubble. All right, let's weigh the pros and cons and continue our journey with part three, false negatives with glucose. So we're going to start out again by prefacing the gold standard as of right now is still the aspirate and culture. So they go in, they suck out some juice, and then they culture the juice, they put on a Petri dish, and they watch to see what funky stuff grows. This is still considered the gold standard for diagnosing SIBO, and it's done a lot in research studies, not so much clinically. And the thing to know about this is when we are comparing the glucose breath test to the supposed gold standard, we need to know first and foremost that the gold standard isn't really gold. It's maybe bronze at best. It's highly imperfect. Number one, it's highly dependent on the location that you sample from. So if you take an aspirate from the first 25% of the jejunum, but your SIBO location, the area of overgrowth isn't until the end of the jejunum, well, you just missed the SIBO, boom, false negative. Another big issue is that only about 80% of the bacteria in our gut, or I'm sorry, 80% of the bacteria in our gut cannot be cultured. You put them on a Petri dish and they do nothing because they dead. So we are only culturing a very small, small amount of whatever we suck out when we do an aspirate. And then another wild card to throw out there is that the cutoff value, the, the quantity of bacteria seen in this test method that we label SIBO or not SIBO, well, that's still widely debated and it's changing all the time. So we will get into this a little bit more, but I wanted to preface this. If you want me to do an expanded video about the pros and cons and issues with aspirate testing, let me know. But it's not done clinically a ton. So I think probably a very small minority of people watching this video have actually had an aspirate culture test done. The vast majority of you have had breath testing though. So I think I'm gonna stick more with breath testing on this channel. This is gonna be more relevant when we're analyzing research and critiquing research, but come with me on the journey. Let me know if you want that video. All right, so this is a systematic review and meta-analysis. I cited this in my previous two videos and they gave the sensitivity and specificity for both types of breath test. And if you look here, so the specificity looks halfway decent. Again, we kind of poked holes in that in the previous video. The sensitivity looks ugh. And as a reference, low sensitivity means higher false negatives. So it's looking already kind of cringe when we look at this, right? But here's, here's the kind of wild card with all of this. When we pool the data and look at a meta-analysis and a systematic review, it's really difficult, particularly in the world of SIBO, because there are so many variables. I guarantee no, none of these two studies were alike. So for example, the quantity of bacteria from the aspirate culture that was considered a positive result. Probably a lot of them were different from each other. When you get into the breath testing, what time cutoff do you use for the for the testing? So we talked about that in the previous two videos. Are you using a 90 minute cutoff, a 120, a 180, 60? Lord knows they're all different. Also the amount of gas, are you using 12 parts per million as a cutoff? Are you using tw 20 parts per million for a cutoff? Those are all different amongst different studies. Uh, and the amount of glucose, did you use 50 grams of glucose, 75, 100? This is there's so much variation in the SIBO literature and it is absolutely dizzying to read all of this crap. So just keep this in mind that the data, even from something high quality, like a systematic review and meta-analysis is probably going to be somewhat lacking 
because of the heterogeneity of the data that they were looking at. But nonetheless, marching on. Uh, here's a study where they looked at small SIBO, compared the aspirate to the glucose breath test. This was in the upper part of the small bowel. And they said that the culture was positive for about 44% of subjects with the lower cutoff, 18% of subjects with the higher cutoff, and glucose was positive in about 27.3% of people. So it's kind of clocking in right in the middle. And it begs the question, is the low cutoff too low, right? Are we lowering the bar so much that non-SIBO people are incorrectly told they have SIBO? Is the high cutoff too high? Are we putting the bar too high and we're missing some people with SIBO and incorrectly telling them that they don't have SIBO? And is glucose accurate or is that high or too low? It's really hard to say because we have these different criteria. But the big question I think in this conversation is just whether or not glucose really reaches the ileum. And that is the last part of the small bowel. And I'm here to tell you, the slide should indicate especially because I put the word really in caps lock. Uh, it does. It actually does. The whole idea that glucose misses distal SIBO, not true. There is concern that glucose could be absorbed in the small intestine before reaching the region of luminal bacterial overgrowth confined to a more distal location. While theoretically plausible, there are no studies employing qualita quantitative cultures from the distal ileum to confirm whether or how often this is a clinical concern in patients with SIBO syndrome. Okay, so that was a 20, uh, 20 paper. This one, they were, it was a pilot study using a gas sensing capsule, and they were doing this on healthy subjects. So these are not people with proposed SIBO necessarily, healthy subjects. And they said, after a large dose of ingested glucose, 40 grams, we're going to put a pin in that, the capsule did detect hydrogen concentrations in the colon similar to those after one and a quarter grams of inulin. This indicates that after a large bolus of glucose, some is malabsorbed. This finding has implications in the interpretation of results from glucose breath test, where 75 grams bolus of glucose increases in breath hydrogen are considered indicative of SIBO. So even after a measly 40 grams of glucose in this test, they had evidence that it did reach the colon, it did reach the cecum, and the bacteria started to ferment the glucose. Well, meanwhile, SIBO breath testing uses anywhere from 50 to 100 grams of glucose. So that's absolutely enough to see that happen. And I don't even know if I agree with the term malabsorbed. Maybe that's just normal physiology. Maybe when you eat that much glucose, it's normal for some of it to reach the colon. Here's another study though. 46 of the patients had abnormal breath test results. Okay. Based on syntigraphy findings, 22 of these patients, 48% had false positive results, which were caused by colon fermentation of unabsorbed glucose. Okay. So here we have a group of patients with irritable bowel syndrome. And sure enough, in about half of them, the glucose not only reached the terminal ileum, but it reached the colon and it gave a false positive glucose result. So yeah, I mean, pretty definitively showing that glucose absolutely can reach not only the ileum, but the colon. The idea that we're gonna get a lot of false negatives with glucose is not as solid as we thought it was. Uh, another possible mechanism for the false negative breath test is the delayed delivery or bypass of the glucose solution to the location in the small bowel where clinically relevant bacterial overgrowth is located. This could occur potentially in such conditions as achalasia, partial gastric outlet obstruction, and proximal enterocutaneous fistula. Negative breath tests in the presence of such conditions should, be, should probably be discounted. This also applies to lactulose. So there is going to be a very, 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 very small minority of people, probably not a lot of people watching this video, to be quite honest with you, but there's going to be a very small minority of people with these conditions where the glucose delivery in the small bowel might be such that it could result in a false negative test. But the idea that glucose doesn't reach the terminal ileum and it's going to miss distal SIBO, that's just... The evidence points to that being incorrect. 
So if this is not an issue that exists, if the glucose not reaching the terminal ileum and resulting in false negatives of distal SIBO, yada, yada, if that, if that doesn't exist, and if we're understanding this correctly, even if you're a bit skeptical, I want you to go on this journey and just noodle on the value of breath testing now. And again, I think the question on everyone's mind is, what now? What do we do now? We, you're just sitting there tearing out your hair, wondering what on earth you're going to do next. So let me take myself off head bubble mode and let's break it in. Let's, let's have a powwow. So this rounds out part three of this initial three-part series. So we saw lactulose breath testing has a ton of false positives to a point where I don't recommend it at all, period. Glucose, we have the issue of potential safety concerns. So people with diabetes, hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, insulin resistance, candida. There's a lot of issues with glucose to begin with from a safety standpoint. I did talk about that in a previous video, which I'll try to remember to link somewhere. If not, just search. It's pretty recent. Um, but now we're seeing from these previous two videos, not only does glucose have a pretty high rate of false positive results because of glucose delivery to the colon, so about 48% false positives in the one study, now we're looking at, you know, this, this idea that you could have a false negative SIBO test and you need to keep treating the SIBO or you might still have the SIBO. So you need to keep hammering away at it. That is just not super supported with research as it turns out. And now the question is, where do we go from here? Now I'll do another video down the road about you know, just overall impressions from breath testing. Do I recommend it at all? Where do we go from here? But for right now, I'm going to focus on the glucose thing. Probably the majority of you watching this right now have already had a glucose SIBO test and you're trying to figure out how useful that is in your journey. And if that's a tool that's going to help you feel better, a smaller minority of you are probably here before doing a breath test and you're trying to figure out if you should do it or if you should ask your doctor for one. Either way, I don't really think this is a super valuable tool anymore, to be really honest with you. But as depressing as that is, and as frustrating as that is, I think that the reframe here is really important. And that is, this can be very freeing if you let it be freeing. I know it's depressing because you finally had an answer and you were clinging to that and you had what felt like objective truth to guide you. But now, not only are you not shackled to the idea of doing repeat SIBO breath testing, which is a pain in the butt, and it's, it does add up after a while, but now we also open this door for all of these wonderful therapeutic options, and you don't have to shackle yourself to the idea of SIBO and bacterial overgrowth. You don't have to shackle yourself to the idea of restricting your diet to starve the SIBO and antimicrobials and antibiotics to kill the SIBO because there's a high, high likelihood that in fact, you don't have SIBO. So if, again, if you, if you view it with the reframe that I just shared, kind of glass half full, admittedly, if you could get yourself to a point where you see that glass half full, then I think that you could move forward and finally get better and finally feel better with this information and just put SIBO breath testing behind you, to be quite honest. Now, you know, as far as where you go from here, there are two videos on this channel that I think will be especially helpful for a lot of you guys. Uh, number one, when I did my SIBO root cause series, I did a video as part of that series titled what to do if you don't know your root cause. So you can go back and revisit that video. Also more recently, I did a video about how to overcome SIBO without the use of antimicrobials. That is going to be a really good one for you to focus on right now, because really the stuff in there would be helpful regardless if you have SIBO or not. But if you have IBS, SIBO, bloating, pooping problems, the information in that video should put you on the right path and give you ideas for how you move forward, potentially, at my recommendation at least, without breath testing. Now, those are for the people who are just bummed and try to figure out where to go. Last, I want to speak to the skeptics, the people who are maybe just a teeny bit angry at me and are going to leave really rude comments on my YouTube video. If you are feeling saucy and fiery and you think that I don't know what I'm talking about and you want to fact check me, okay, I can meet that energy for what it is. 
um, I have made a Google, uh, a Google Drive folder that contains the PDF of every single article I read for this series of videos. I also included my PowerPoint slides as well as my notes. Now the notes are a hot mess because they're, they're notes that I took for myself, not for you, but I decided that that might be really helpful to share my actual notes with you. It's about a 30 or 32 page Word document where I, I pulled quotes and I highlighted stuff from all of these different studies. So I'm gonna give you my notes, the PowerPoint slides and the, PD, the full PDF for every single article that I referenced here. If you wanna fact check me or if you just wanna learn more and nerd out, by all means, I'm gonna give you the tools to do that. I'll put the link in the description and the first comment. Um, just send me your email and I will shoot that back to you with that link so you have that whole library at your disposal and you can nerd out until your little heart is content. Um, in the meantime, I will see you in future videos where we not only talk about SIBO breath testing and SIBO, don't worry, by the way, I'm not going to become this big SIBO denier and stop making videos about SIBO. But uh, I will see you for the next video on this channel where we talk about gut health, IBS, SIBO, motility, gut brain axis, microbiome. Those are the topics that I like hanging out in. And I hope that this at least initial wave of SIBO breath test and Anal, uh, analyzing has been helpful for you. Thank you so much for tuning in. And if you feel that this was helpful, or if you feel that this is a message that more people need to hear, if you would share this video in any Facebook groups or forums that you're in, I would be deeply, deeply appreciative. Thank you so much. And I'll see you in the next video. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.